looking mansion. And when we stopped in his driveway, she said she started telling me things about, okay, well, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a guy um, that you're going to give a massage to. He's just, he's going to ask you to take your shirt and your pants off. Uh, But don't worry, you can keep your underwear and your bra on. And I, I just remember thinking like, Okay, well, you know, I go to the beach uh, in a bathing suit and that shouldn't be that big of a deal. But still, like, this is becoming a little bit more scary and real and something completely different than what I thought was supposed to happen. They pull up to the man's mansion and enter through a gate. Nobody even looked at me. Nobody second guessed why there was a young two young girls walking in to the back gate. There was like the guy outside doing trimming flowers. I mean, but nobody looked up. Nobody really cared that there were young girls walking into the back of this old man's mansion. She says her friend leaned in and whispered. She said, if anybody asks if you're over the age of 18, just go ahead and go with it. And I was like, are they going to (laughs) ask? And she's like, I don't know. I don't think so. But in case they do, just say yes. Michelle tells police that an assistant came to her and said that the man was ready. The woman brought her upstairs and told her, This is what's going to happen. Jeffrey's going to be in there. Uh, just go in there. There's lotions on the countertop. Um, he's on the phone. Just don't worry about it. Just do what he asks. Just do what he asks. Michelle enters the room and says Epstein was already on the massage table. I didn't know his name, didn't know what he looked like, didn't know anything about this person. He was on the phone. He was laying on his uh, stomach on a table. There was a little vanity kind of table next to him. The room was colder. It was kind of dim. And with that, she says the assistant set a timer and left Michelle alone to begin the massage. I I was starting to get really nervous and my heart was starting to race. And like that feeling you get where you know something bad is about to happen. We're in the room. He's on the phone. He's got a towel on covering his butt and um, he's naked. I assumed underneath the towel in the beginning. And then he was on the phone for a good long time. They, you know, they turned on that timer when I got in there. And so I was like, okay, you know, this is com- comforting. <laughs> I don't have to talk to this person. He's just going to be lying just like this. He wants me to massage his feet. Not a big deal. Um, until it became a big deal. Here's Michelle from her interview with police one year after her visit to Epstein's. And as a warning... The language here is graphic. And then he could grab my side and he was backing himself up. Michelle told the detective that she saw Epstein masturbating as he began to touch her. He touched her breasts, then his hand moved down to her underwear. Michelle said he began molesting her. She remembers looking at the timer, praying it would ring. I don't know how long it's been, but if that little timer could just ring, it would be wonderful because I'm assuming that's when all of this nightmare is going to be over with. He went back to just putting his hand down there. And then Michelle stood there, frozen. I couldn't run. I couldn't leave. And I just didn't know how to save myself. There was nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. I was a young girl that did not want to get in trouble. I mean, honestly, I was I was terrified. To be honest, I didn't think leaving was an option. I was living second by second, hoping that I would see the other side of that door. And I didn't know who this guy was. I didn't know what he was capable of. Epstein finished and the timer finally went off. Afterwards, he handed Michelle $300 in cash, saying, there's 200 for you and 100 for your friend. When I left the room, I was really qu- quiet. I went downstairs. I, I was just like, had my head down, like looking at the ground, kind of like 
what just happened to me. I had no idea what just went on. Michelle meets her friend downstairs and says she was astonished that her friend simply shrugged off what happened to her. And she said, oh, that's not a big deal. Like, he tried that with my other friend. I was thinking, like, you knew this happened to somebody else, and you still brought me here? And I was just, I was really sad that somebody that I thought I could trust or somebody that I thought was my friend was far from it. I put my sunglasses on and I cried the whole way home and I was just thinking about I'm never going to let anybody touch me again. I don't want anybody to look at me. I don't want anybody to touch me. There was a guy that I liked and I was thinking about him and I was like, God, I, I, if anybody ever knew about this, what would I look like? I would look like a terrible person. As police continued their investigation, they were learning about more girls like Michelle, but also about more girls like her friend, young women who were being asked to bring their friends over to Epstein's home. Were you ever told to bring friends? Mm-hmm. Did he ask you to bring people or? Well, he's, he's like, yeah, if you have any friends who want to do it, you know, like if I can or whatever, because I was working two jobs at the time. So. Maybe because you brought a girl who made it all not a few hundred dollars. You made a few hundred dollars? Mm-hmm. Has keeping up with the news become a chore? Get caught up with Start Here, the daily podcast from ABC News. Quick and simple, every morning, the headlines driving your day and why they matter. Subscribe to Start Here wherever you get your podcasts. The first time he asked me if I could bring him girls, that I don't know if he could tell that I was just extremely uncomfortable or if he, he didn't even care about that. He just wanted more girls. I'm not sure. This is Courtney Wilde. She's 32 now, and before she met Epstein, Courtney was also a good student who was very involved in school. Played the trumpet. I was on the cheerleading squad, so I would do cheerleading camps and stuff like that during the summers. Um, I was actually a very good student, straight A's and B's. Courtney was raised by a single mother who she says was not around much. When I was young, my parents weren't around. I was living at a friend's house. It was just a hard time in general. When Courtney was 14 years old, she started to hear about girls who were making money from a rich guy in Palm Beach. A lot of girls knew about it and a lot of girls were doing it. And it was like not a shameful thing. When it was brought to me, it wasn't like uncool to do it. I didn't have any obviously have any income. So Courtney said yes. She would eventually become a recruiter for Epstein. But she started, like all the other girls, going over to Epstein's home to give him massages. And I remember just like walking down the stairs after it was all done and just being like, just feeling so disgusting and shameful, you know, just like a whole bunch of emotions wrapped in one. But and then in the same way, you know, I had two hundred dollars that I didn't have before. It was just a tough pillow to swallow. And it was the money that kept her coming back. He would need somebody of my type who had, you know, nobody to go home to. He didn't have mom and dad at the time. It was just, you know, very isolated. The girls that, you know, myself included, we were, it was basically, I don't want to say poverty, but I mean, you know, we did not have a good good childhood it, by any means. If we did, it would, we grew up in trailer parks and, you know, single, par- single parent homes and just broken, already broken. And that's what he preyed on. There were times where she didn't have food, she didn't have clothes, and she's a 14-year-old kid who has needs. This is Brad Edwards, Courtney Wilde's attorney. From the perspective of somebody from a trailer park who's just staying at school and trying to make sure that she makes it to school every day with no real place to go home to, and if this activity that she's being made to do is being directed by this very powerful person 
then it must be okay. And not only did he convince her, he convinces dozens and dozens of children of this fact. I mean, it's the whole scene that, that brings them in. But it becomes a lifestyle. Because after she makes $200, why wouldn't she go back later that week and make another $200? The massages were bringing Courtney some much-needed income. But then she was told by Epstein about a way she could make even more money without having to touch him. She could become a recruiter. For every girl I could bring him, he would give me $200 for them. So I agreed and I gave him my number. I felt like it was an opportunity for me to, you know, because I was so young and basically homeless and stuff like that, that I felt like it was an opportunity for me to like get on my feet, so to speak. She has more money than she's ever had. She can buy new clothes. And school just became an afterthought. In fact, after a while, if Courtney was going to school, it was mainly to recruit other girls to go to Jeffrey Epstein's house. She doesn't have parents who are really monitoring the situation, who have any supervision. She knows only other children who also don't really have parents supervising the situation. Courtney even came to understand that Epstein had preferences for the types of girls that she should bring. Definitely the younger, the better. He just wanted young white girls, you know. And there would even be times where I, when I would find a girl that was, you know, 14, 15, even 16, but looked like she was 12, that he would pay 300 for her, you know. And the next time if I brought her and he really liked her, he would, you know, the next time he would call me and say, hey, what about such and such? Um, well, if you can get her here, I'll pay 300 Like he, it was no, he made it known what he liked and what he didn't like. She came to depend on Epstein and his money. He was my source of income. By this time, I have my own apartment, um, but I'm like paying my way. I have my own stuff. So I feel like independent and confident. And I'm like kind of proud that, you know, I'm making my own money and everything else. Basically, all my time, I just invested in like recru- recruiting these girls, my childhood friends, friends of friends. She is indoctrinated to believe when she's very young, 14 years old, that this is appropriate behavior. And this is just what the rich and powerful do. Once you train a 14 year old that this is okay, this behavior is okay. And she gets used to the the money that comes with it. You've groomed her perfectly. Courtney would spend more than two years recruiting for Epstein. And looking back, she says she feels remorse for ever agreeing to bring other girls to his home. I hold such an extreme amount of guilt for doing these things, for bringing these girls. And now that I've gotten older, that I just hold so much guilt for ever having somebody do that or introducing that to somebody's life. A lot of my life has been a struggle, you know, self-medicating just to feel normal, anxiety. um, It's a lot of things that I've just bared with and still am working through and trying to get over. Palm Beach police would speak with at least 17 girls and young women during the course of their investigation, but the scope of evidence would be much larger. There is a great deal to be learned from a person's trash. Once it has been discarded and placed on the street, it's uh, considered by the law to be abandoned. This is former Palm Beach police chief Michael Ryder. Starting in 2005, Ryder oversaw the team that investigated Jeffrey Epstein, And he says, right from the beginning, his detectives took the girls and their stories seriously and dug in. And he says that besides working to identify more victims, they were also watching their suspect. Immediately after the first victim, we began surveilling to see whether or not there were other victims so we could stop it. But surveilling Epstein's home would present challenges. Here it is, a very small dead-end road with massive homes. And he lives at the very end. It's got a gated front. There's not much to see. Epstein's mansion is situated on a narrow dead-end road called El Brillo Way, tucked away from the main strip of Palm Beach Island. 
there's not a lot of traffic on El Brillo Way at all. Epstein's house in Palm Beach doesn't stand out in any way. It's a two-story sort of Mediterranean-looking house. It's white. These rows of hedges have to be 